Coming up on Mayo Clinic Q&A. At Mayo, we're really expanding what we can offer patients that have uh, limb sarcomas. Not only are we working on ways of getting the muscle and the nerve and the lymphatics back, we're working on ways of controlling pain in those patients that still have to undergo amputations. And, and that's with essentially tricking the nerves into thinking that they're still uh, going back to the muscles and the skin. And for patients that live with chronic phantom pain, this can be an amazing blessing. Soft tissue sarcomas are a rare form of cancer that develop in places like muscle, fat, nerves, and tendons. Treating these cancers often involves complex surgery to transfer muscle and nerves. Today, we'll discuss how new surgical techniques are helping patients recover faster and get back to life. And with the advent of microsurgery and some uh, newer materials that we can apply to these muscles, we can have this transferred muscle regenerate and take the place of the muscle that's been excised. And, and we've been very fortunate to have patients go back to ambulating and back to some of the activities that they were doing before surgery. Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. Soft tissue sarcomas are rare forms of cancer that have been typically treated with what has been called limb salvage surgery combined with radiation therapy. While limb salvage surgery helps patients avoid amputations, patients are often left with substantial functional limitations. Now, advancements in microsurgery are making it possible to harness the body's own ability to regenerate muscle strength after surgery that is performed to, to remove soft tissue sarcomas. This is a process called onco-regeneration, and it's our topic for today. Joining us to discuss are Mayo Clinic orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Matthew Hodeck, and plastic surgeon, Dr. Stephen Moran. Thank you for being here today, gentlemen. Thanks for having us. I think it's just wonderful to have all this brain power together in one space. And I always say on this program that I love to learn something new every day. And I can tell already that I'm going to learn something new today. So let's jump right in. Can you tell me what the standard course of treatment is for an individual who suffers from a sarcoma? What is limb salvage surgery anyway? Sure, I can, I can take that one. So limb salvage surgery is the process where you're able to remove the cancer with a negative margin uh, and still be able to preserve the function of the limb. And so in the 1970s and 80s, we didn't used to think about doing limb salvage for patients. Patients presented, and then oftentimes they were treated with pretty much an immediate amputation. And it was through kind of the developments of different neoadjuvant treatments, such as mainly radiation therapy for soft tissue sarcomas, but also chemotherapy uh, for patients with bone sarcomas, that limb salvage was be now a viable treatment option for a vast majority of patients. And so there's only certain times where we consider now amputations for patients on uh, a vast, vast majority of patients are getting limb salvage surgery. And so it's through a multidisciplinary process where patients are first evaluated uh, by either our service or the medical oncology service. We will figure out what type of cancer they have. And then we go through the process of either referring them to radiation oncology for neoadjuvant radiation, which means giving radiation before the surgery. Uh, and then typically we wait about three or four weeks uh, and then surgery is performed after that. Um, and so radiation helps with the local control of the tumor. So it lets us be very close to the tumor where we have to be to save critical structures such as nerves and blood vessels. But oftentimes, or excuse me, there can be times where that's not possible. And that's where some of the regenerative stuff that we're working on can come, come into play. What an incredible difference it must make to your patients to retain their limbs and their function and uh, also their appearance, honestly, when they have a sarcoma like this, that has to be incredible to um, the advancements that are happening. Yeah, it's really changed the way that we're able to approach patients. And then, you know, the big thing is, is just the, the big teamwork that it does require to, to take care of these patients. Sure. We hear so much about regenerative medicine now. Is onco-regeneration a type of regenerative medicine? Well, I, I think, uh, as you heard Dr. Hodick saying, you know, in the past, I'd say 20 years, we've been able to save these patients' legs, but many times they don't function very well. Uh, and, you know, we, we were able, Dr. Hodick talks about a, a negative margin. So that means you have to take a rim of normal tissue around these tumors. And that often results in patients losing the majority of their quadricep muscle, which allows the knee to extend, or their hamstring muscle, which allows the knee to bend. So we save the leg, but the patient can't 
play sports, okay. they can't walk with their spouse, things like that. So now we have the ability to take um, muscle that's expendable. We usually take a muscle from the back and we can put that in place of the muscle that Dr. Hodak has to remove. We're able to then roll that muscle uh, into a tube so that it can either replace the hamstring or the quadricep muscle. And then we repair the nerve that used to go to the quadricep into this new muscle that we've transferred in. And with the advent of microsurgery and some uh, newer materials that we can apply to these muscles, we can have this transferred muscle regenerate and take the place of the muscle that's been excised. And, and we've been very fortunate to have patients go back to ambulating and back to some of the uh, activities that they were doing before surgery. That's amazing to me, Steve, because I, I, I'm not an anatomist, but thinking about function and the strength of a, the back muscle it has a very probably different function than what you'd have from your quadricep muscle. So it's very interesting that a muscle can sort of learn to be a different type of muscle or to do a different function. Yeah, that's true. I think we've experimented uh, with different ways of, of insetting the muscle, but I think the latest technology now that allows us to tension and insert the muscle directly back into the bone uh, has been very favorable in getting these patients back to doing what they want to do. Tell me and tell our listeners a little bit about how you translate um, lab experimentation into uh, clinical practice for patients. Well, uh, I think many times we uh, ha have an idea and then we go to the lab and, you know, we either work in a cell culture dish or we can use animal models that try to approximate the uh, human condition. Uh, but it's, it's always uh, difficult to get a perfect match. I think um, many of the things that we're working on now in the lab are, are working with a, a special uh, material called an exosome, which uh, allows the body to harness some of the uh, potential in stem cells and uh, accelerate healing. So right now what we're working on in this oncoregenerative model is using some of these uh, exosomes which uh, are produced here at Mayo Clinic and uh, using those in, a, in the lab in a way that helps us uh, regenerate or, or reconstruct uh, missing muscle and missing nerve. And we're in the uh, beginning process of an FDA trial right now. We hope that we can deliver this new uh, research to our patients within the near future. Wow, that's amazing. Matt, you touched just very briefly on um, a team-based approach and how a team is required to care for these patients. How is a team-based approach used differently in onco-regeneration than it might be in limb salvage surgery, or is it different? I think, you know, the basics of it are kind of our own, the whole framework of what kind of makes Mayo Mayo in the sense that we're all here to help the patient. And so for onco-regeneration, these are cases that uh, Steve and I typically do together. Um, but, you know, can we use other plastic surgeons as well? Yeah, we do. But I think, you know, having the team, we know pretty much exactly what I need to do. When I'm approaching the patient, I know what I need to make Steve's life easier putting the patient back. And so I don't think you know, that we kind you of, ever do that really though. <laughs> we're, I'm kind of the destructor, Dr. Moran's the reconstructor. And so, you know, we have to take out what we have to take out in order to uh, you know, cure the patient of their cancer. However, I know that no matter what I do, I have Steve who can put the patient back together. And I think that's kind of having the team and the kind of, uh, I guess, trust in the team too, that knowing that no matter what you do, the patient's going to get through all this. But it does take a team in the sense that, you know, it starts with the initial workup. It starts with the initial scans in radiology and making sure the scans are done correctly. We're getting them to see radiation oncology right away. And you know, we have a discussion with the radiation oncologist about, you know, what are we going to take? What are we going to leave behind? So that way they can plan their treatment fields uh, appropriately to, again, uh, reduce the risk of recurrence. Uh, and then we take over for surgery and Steve and I will talk about the case beforehand and we'll know exactly what we're doing when we go in. And, you know, vast majority of the time, what we take out is what we plan to take out. And then Dr. Moran does an excellent job of putting the patients back together and we get the patients back because then afterwards too, it's the rehab and kind of working with the physical therapists and everything back here in Mayo. That was a lot of confidence in your ability, Steve. Uh, yeah, he gives me too much credit. I, I think that a lot of the stuff we're able to do now has really only been possible within in the past decade. We've had uh, massive advancements in uh, 
the microscope itself, make, allowing us to see things at a much smaller level. Uh, some of the things that Dr. Hodick is uh, talking about removing are not only muscles, but nerves and lymphatic structures themselves. And all these things contribute potentially the patient's function, but also to post-operative pain. And uh, Dr. Hodick and, and uh, myself have been working a lot with taking these nerves that normally would be left to scar into the wound bed and cause a source of pain. And we're now reconnecting those to uh, devitalized muscle. We're also putting back together the lymphatic structures that are divided anytime you have surgery in an effort to prevent patients from developing post-operative lymphedema, which is essentially swelling that it can occur in, in the leg uh, or in the arm that can cause pain and, and disfigurement. What kind of outcomes are you seeing in your patients at this point? Sure. Um, so a vast majority of patients are returning to ambulation without the use of gate aids or a brace. You know, we talk about, you know, sciatic nerve resection, and there was a study that was done here uh, that looked at, you know, patients that had their sciatic nerve removed, um, and they have acceptable function. And so, but that's based off of scoring systems that we use as physicians to say, you know, what is someone acceptable at? Uh, you know, sciatic nerve resection, oftentimes patients will have to wear a brace. They'll need to walk with um, a crutch or a cane. And when they start having kind of increasing work of walking or so say they're trying to like walk uphill or upstairs and it becomes very difficult for them. And so what we're able to do is we're able to restore that function through, uh, we've done some vascularized nerve grafting, but also through the functional muscle transfers, we're able to restore the knee flexion strength that they lose uh, through taking out the nerve to the hamstrings. And so it's not oftentimes just the muscle, you know, so we can do this sort of process too when we have to take nerves out as well in order to restore the function as well. But um, a vast majority of patients will have a restoration and at least uh, active flexion or extension past gravity. Most of the times they're able to do this against a lot of resistance too. And they're able to go back to doing all the activities that they want to do. I recently had a patient come back who told me that he went out back to elk hunting and so walking on uneven terrain without any gate aids or anything with having pretty much the entire quadricep taken out. And so that's kind of a big thing for him because, you know, that was a passion of his to do. And so they're still able to go back and do everything they want to do once they're recovered from it. Wow, that is wonderful. Amazing. It must be very gratifying to care for your patients in that way. It is. Tell me what you see ahead. What do you think the next decade holds for, um, oncologic surgeries? Uh, Matt, maybe I could take this one. I, you know, I think at Mayo here, we've, we're really expanding what we can offer patients that have uh, limb sarcomas. Not only are we working on ways of getting the muscle and the nerve and the lymphatics back, but for those patients that still can not have limb salvage, we're working on newer options such as osteointegrated implants. So this is uh, something that uh, r really started in the military and, and is just starting to come to fruition here at Mayo. But this is uh, putting in, an implant into a patient's bone that allows them to kind of snap on a prosthetic that they can wear for the entire day. Some of the uh, work from the military has shown that, that people don't even take these off. They wear them for the entire day, which is something that's much different than what we have now. They can go back to much more, uh, I guess, uh, aggressive activities than we weren't, weren't able to uh, uh, achieve before in patients with standard amputations. In addition, uh, we're working on ways of controlling pain in those patients that still have to undergo amputations. And, and that's with essentially tricking the nerves into thinking that they're still uh, going back to the muscles and the skin. And for patients that live with chronic phantom pain, this can be an amazing blessing. And then finally, uh, what we were talking about before, by trying to harvest uh, or uh, harness, I guess I should say, the body's ability to heal itself uh, with this uh, exosome material, which is something that can be made here at Mayo for pennies and put into these wounds and have the body uh, essentially regenerate muscle and nerve. Uh, that's really where we see the uh, future of this field going over the next 10 years. Wow. Those are some amazing areas and uh, working in the pain clinic. I do see some of the unfortunate patients who have difficulty after they have surgeries uh, for sarcomas and or amputations for other reasons as well. So that's exciting work. Uh, Matt, as you uh, and Steve were speaking, it struck me as I have um, heard from many others 
that how important it, it likely is for patients to seek out a center where there's a high volume and where there are experienced individuals when they want to um, have when they want to be able to have the best surgical options that they can have. What would you say to that to patients? How do they how do they know that they're getting the best care that they can get? Sure. <clears throat> and so you know the Institute of Medicine has kind of put an emphasis on you know quality of care and you know quality of cancer care because it is a, a vulnerable patient population and you know there's lots of studies that have been done to look at you know outcomes of patients with sarcoma and even some of the stuff that we've done here through the um, Kern Center and Optum Labs we've you know found that patients who are treated at higher volume centers oftentimes are able to avoid amputation and so patients who are treated at smaller hospitals or public or non-teaching hospitals were had a higher risk of, of having an amputation uh, with a sarcoma compared to larger centers or teaching hospitals where a vast majority of times they'll have a limb salvage surgery. And so a lot of that is, is the expertise and being able to bring patients in uh, to have them see the multidisciplinary team that these cases require uh, and it leads to the better outcomes for the patients. And so, you know, quality is driven by numbers of cases per year. And so here at Mayo, we're doing hundreds of cases of these, of soft tissue sarcomas a year. And it just kind of shows in the outcomes as well uh, that that's been shown in lots of different studies to show that, you know, the quality is always better if it's done at a high volume center. And we're always happy to see people uh, from wherever. We're happy to do virtual care for them too and discuss their cases as well at our tumor board. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Any last thoughts that you'd like to share with our listeners today, either of you? No, it's an exciting field and, you know, we're happy to go over anything that patients have any questions on. We're always happy to do virtual visits with them. We're happy to get in touch and help however we can. I Thank would you. just, yeah, I'd echo that. If, if you have a question about uh, your sarcoma care, please reach out to us. We're happy to always uh, respond. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I did learn something today. <laughs> Our thanks to Mayo Clinic orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Matthew Hodeck, and plastic surgeon, Dr. Stephen Moran, for being here today to talk to us about sarcomas and the use of onco-regenerative surgery uh, to manage them. I hope that you learned something. I know that I did. We wish each of you a very wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.